So welcome everyone. Um, it is a distinct pleasure to have today uh, Dr. Santangeli from the Cleveland Clinic um, visiting us. Uh, Pasquale has been a leader in the field for a number of years now. His training was originally in Italy, in Rome, where he did uh, medical school and, and cardiology training. And then he followed that with a series of uh, fellowships in the United States, first in Austin, and then in Stanford, and then in UPenn, uh, where he established himself as a leader in, in the field of ET and in general in procedural EP. He's made a uh, wide range of contributions uh, from the clinical management, the uh, assessment of risk of VT ablation to actual procedural techniques, uh, where he's basically led the field in, in how to do a good job with VT ablation. Um, he is a um, regular speaker in, in national and international meetings and a reference to all of us in the field, and we're very happy to uh, have you, Pasquale. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Valderabano, and I'm deeply honored to be in this institution where the history of cardiology CT surgery was made. So uh, in the next um, probably 30 minutes or so, uh, I'll talk about uh, catheter ablation of VT in advanced heart failure, which is something I'm very passionate about, and how to manage risk. These are um, my disclosures. So how did we start with this risk gratification uh, problem? So if you look at the consensus document for VT ablation back in 2009, there was essentially no recommendation on how to manage patients with advanced heart failure. The only thing that was recommended here to pay attention to fluid management during the procedure, but there was really no recommendation because there was no evidence essentially uh, how to stratify patients pre-procedure for risk of heart failure. I'll try to convince you in the next uh, few minutes that risk stratification is important. Um, the first point I want to make, the catheter ablation of VT really in patients with structural heart disease is a team sport. It's not just the AP doctor that does it. It requires an institution and collaboration with different sections, imaging, heart failure, and CT surgery. And there is no star in this team. The entire team has to shine to make sure that we have good outcomes. Risk stratification is important regardless of the procedural approach used. We all love something that we call substrate-based ablation, that we ablate and map in sinus rhythm. And I'll show you later that's not always feasible or possible. I'm a strong believer that a multidisciplinary approach in patients with VT and structural heart disease will improve outcomes. Of course, more to come on this, and we need more data. And whoever is involved in ablation of VT in structural heart disease does have to have expertise, of course, in the management of advanced heart failure decision for mechanical hemodynamic support and timing of support and management support devices. And also importantly, I think, we need to have some form of understanding of what the potential exit plan is if the ablation goes wrong or the heart failure doesn't get better. And therefore, we need to know if the patient has an exit plan in terms of LVAD, transplant or no exit plan, which is a subgroup of patients that is very important. It modifies the way we look at, at the patients and the way we ablate them and we uh, follow them afterwards. So it's clear now that these days most of our procedures are done with so-called substrate-based ablation approach. And there are different approaches used that are all essentially very similar. You reconstruct a map of the substrate here just for the non eps Anything that you see in red is scar and anything that you see in purple is normal tissue most of the times. And again, we focus on the scar area and we try to ablate. These are the uh, red dots essentially of ablation in those areas where we uh, assume that AVT is coming from. So um, the assumption here is that with substrate-based ablation of VT, you do not need to induce VT, and therefore you have little risk of decompensation during the procedure. However, there is a group of patients that we can simply cannot do substrate-based ablation. This is just an example, uh, a 67-year-old with advanced non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, very low ejection fraction, presenting with VT storm, 67 SED shocks over one month, Ablation was attempted, aborted because of incessant VT during the procedure in cardiogenic shock, and therefore was uh, uh, transferred in incessant VT despite lidocaine and myodron intubation and sedation. It's clear that mapping sinus rhythm here and reconstructing the scar in sinus rhythm is essentially not feasible, not possible. <coughs> And this is what happened during the procedure. Uh, we, of course, wanted to map in sinus rhythm, but as soon as we put any catheter in the ventricle, there is, of course, different VTs that switch from VT1 to VT5. They're all very fast, and none of them is hemodynamically stable. So therefore, it's clear that this patient does not, um, will not tolerate a procedure without some form of mechanical support that we need to put in, and we'll talk about that later. <coughs> 
So how often then we can do substrate-based ablation in sinus rhythm? This was data from Paolo de la Bella, 528 patients undergoing 634 procedures. But what I'm gonna point out here is that 29% presented with high burden of VT, electrical storm, and 11% in the lab with incessant VT. It's clear that in these cases, there is no way that we can target the substrate in sinus. And another point I wanna make is that uh, um, uh, patients with uh, scar, essentially with substrate, doesn't always mean that the VT will come from that substrate. There's about 5% of cases where the VT comes from areas outside the scar, fascicular reentry, bundle branch reentry, focal VTs from the cusp region that is independent from the scar. And if you go just bleeding the scar, you will miss an important portion of patients. We did learn also, uh, and this was actually a retrospective analysis, that if we, uh, the way we used to practice, that we take the patients to the lab, we wait, uh, we try everything we can, we wait for the compensation to happen, and then we ask for help, either CT surgery or our colleagues from heart failure, that wasn't really a good strategy. Here uh, you see the data from 21 patients that we brought to the lab with high burden of VT, ended up having cardiogenic shock during the procedure and we bailed them out with ECMO acutely, right, as a bailout strategy. And if you look at the outcomes here, this is the worst survival curve you've ever seen in VT ablation uh, papers. Uh, there was 80% mortality at about 30 days after the uh, event, essentially, and the only patient that survived is because our heart failure colleagues were kind enough to evaluate them emergently, and they ended up qualifying for LVAD on transplant. And the other aspect is that since most of these patients died in the hospital, essentially, we knew exactly what the mode of death was, which it was uh, uh, important. Even if we were able to manage VT, even with limited ablation sometimes, 70% of patients ended up dying because of heart failure. So that's important that we need to, in some ways, find this, a solution to re-stratify these patients to prevent this from happening. And that's where the PAINS D score, uh, some of you may be familiar with this, uh, came, came about. Essentially, uh, we looked at 193 patients with scarlated VT, and we just looked at two uh, primary, uh, two endpoints, essentially. First one was a cardiogenic shock or periprocedural AHD, we call it acute hemodynamic decompensation. That was defined as a sustained hypotension with a blood pressure systolic less than 80 to 90 millimeters of mercury despite increasing doses of vasopressors and requiring two things. You either stop the procedure early so you, you don't get the job done, or you have to bail them out with some form of mechanical support like intraortic balloon pump or impella. And the secondary endpoint was all-cause mortality after follow-up. And again, here we didn't look at VT-free survival. We had some resistance from the reviewers because we were not looking at that. But I was really interested in understanding if we can predict some form of hemodynamic decompensation during the procedure. And that's what we found when we ran the uh, logistic regression analysis. We found these variables here. They ended up cre creating the PAINS D score. Essentially, they were associated with a higher risk of acute decompensation. It's interesting when you look at these variables, there is only one that you can actually modify with the procedure, is the use of general anesthesia. That was actually something that we uh, uh, used as a um, uh, strategy in some patients, and maybe some selection bias. But all the other variables here, pulmonary disease, advanced age, NYHA class three or four, we can modify them during the procedure. So these patients already come in with high risk, and these are the uh, score that was essentially made rounding the uh, odds ratio of the logistic regression analysis to the next integral level. And if you look at the third tiles of score here, essentially you'll see that there is a clear increase in the incidence of acute hemodynamic decompensation with increased third tiles. The first third tile, less than 10 points, second one between 10 and 16 points, and the third third tile is of 25% risk of decompensation if the pain's D score was greater than 17 points. So based on this, we thought that we could use potentially this score to stratify patients at high risk of decompensation. And another important aspect that I wanna show you here is that if you look back at the data from our paper here, the majority, 63% of patients, the episode of acute decompensation happened during substrate ablation and not during VT induction for mapping, which was an interesting finding. So uh, some red flags that we found, and we didn't really advertise that much in the paper as a result, but we discussed about that because that's something that we're still looking at it. Of course, there are some red flags for acute decompensation that is maybe happening. Of course, hypotension is number one. When you have evidence of uh, systemic vasoconstriction or uh, reduced urinary output, when the serum lactate increases, a particular above two, we found as a threshold. And in some patients, we had a wedge um, pressure monitoring, and whenever there is an acute increase, uh, 
uh, more than 50 millimeters of mercury or significant increase that means more than 5 or 10 above baseline value. However, when we looked at the sensitivity and specificity as a predictor of each one of this one, none of this was uh, associated with uh, um, um, uh, good sensitivity and specificity and positive predicted value for acute decompensation. Of course, if you have these two events at the same time, if you have acute hypotension and increase in the uh, wedge pressure, uh, one common finding that we can correct is we are tethering the mitral valve with our catheters and we can pull back essentially and uh, um, essentially rescue from acute MR. Another important way of monitoring patients, I think, is monitoring pressures during the procedure, in invasive pressures, and that's the way we've been doing it. We either go transeptal, so we continuously monitor the left atrial pressure for delta increase from baseline, or we go retrograde aortic with a long sheath monitoring the LVDP. So we have baseline measurement of pressure, and we measure that every, roughly every hour during the procedure, so to see where we are. And also the CVP transducer here to monitor the central venous pressure because it gives us a sense of uh, how the right ventricle is doing. Ideally, of course, you want to have a wedge pressure, a PA catheter, although that increases the complexity and number of access, so we've been abandoning there. And cerebral oximetry is also something that we monitor as a marker of end organ perfusion, although, again, I have to say it's not very uh, sensitive and specific to predict. I think intracardiac pressures are much more specific and sensitive to um, uh, changes in hemodynamic status. Another important um, uh, uh, thing that we have to manage during the procedure is fluid overload. All of our catheters now are irrigated with saline. That means most of the time, especially for large substrates, we end up with a lot of uh, fluid overload, usually 1.5 to 2 liters of volume that we give patients. And especially for those that have uh, um, chronic kidney failure and uh, diuretic to uh, into uh, resistance and so forth, we cannot really manage them with diuretics during the procedure. So we've been using now a continuous ultrafiltration in some of these patients to make sure that we can manage the fluid overload at the time of the procedure. And it's something that uh, we've been using it in select group of patients with fairly good outcomes. Back to the acute decompensation issue, when that happens, that selects a group of patients at very high risk of early mortality. If you look at this Kaplan-Meier curve from the same paper I showed you earlier, this is freedom from death, and you see a patient in the dashed line is the one with acute decompensation that are of significantly higher risk of early mortality. Really, the curves separate fairly early, and then they tend to be parallel after about six months post-procedure. So this would indicate if you can prevent acute decompensation potentially during the procedure, we may have make an impact in terms of reduction of post-procedural mortality. So of course, these were our data from the university when I was back at the University of Pennsylvania. So how well do they apply to other institutions? And we put together this registry uh, together with the IVTCC, uh, 12 centers essentially in the United States, high volume centers for VT ablation, 2,061 patients with scarlated VT uh, across 12 uh, institutions in the US. And here we didn't have really data from acute decompensation, so we used as a proxy early mortality post procedure, 30 day mortality. And here what we found, first of all, that the incidence of early mortality post VT ablation is 5% at 30 days. Just to give you an example, the mortality of a combined valve surgery and cabbage is way below 3%. So a message I want to give to everybody that the VT ablation uh, is really a fairly high risk procedure, essentially, probably the highest risk procedure that we do in cardiology and potentially also CT surgery. And when we looked at the PAINS D score, essentially, we look at the um, uh, here uh, just uh, absolute values, but it was able to differentiate patients with risk of early mortality between day zero and day 30, late mortality between one month and 12 months, and the survivors. So again, they perform well also in this multicenter registry. In addition to the PAINS D score, periprocedural AKI, which is a marker of poor organ perfusion, is another strong predictor of early mortality. Here, in a different contribution, we'll look at patients where we have serial creatinine uh, measurements pre and post procedure. And if you have a periprocedural AKI, uh, within, typically within a week post procedure, this selects a group of patients that, in addition to the PAINS D score, have high risk of early mortality. If you look at the mode of death for patients that die early within 30 days post procedure, of course this comes from the registry, so in, in one third roughly we didn't have the data for that, but most of the deaths are really due to uh, um, cardiac that is not VT related, and most of the time it's really due to heart failure. And one important predictor, in addition to the pain's D score of uh, early mortality, was periprocedural complications, any form of complication. So this is actually something that we, uh, of course, we can modify. 
but um, uh, you can see here the odds ratio for early mortality is close to four. So increases the factor by a factor of four, essentially, the risk of early mortality uh, post-procedure. So uh, as a general message, if you have to decide to make a procedure safer or more, more effective uh, or more effective in patients with heart failure, I think we go for safer first because we found that this actually factor per complications was much higher in terms of the predictive value compared to acute success during the procedure. We didn't have the numbers to look at the type of complications and the impact, but it seemed with this uh, subgroup analysis, of course, it's way underpowered that thrombotic complications, DVTs, strokes, and so forth, were significantly higher risk compared to bleeding. But of course, take this with grain of salt because of the low numbers. So how does the pains D score perform against other risk factors, risk scores that we use in the, in the heart failure? This was a, a series of patients with non ischemic cardiomyopathy that we looked at. And we, we compared the pains D score, that was our score that we came up with after that initial <coughs> study, with a series of other scores, including a Seattle Heart Failure Model, Adir, Magic, Charm. These are all being uh, studied extensively in the heart failure uh, community as a predictor of uh, adverse outcomes. And here, uh, what we found, this is a very busy slide, but what I want to show you here, is that the best um, uh, um, error under the curve was actually obtained with a Seattle Heart Failure Model, essentially followed by the Pains D score. So from a practical perspective, we still use essentially the pains D score for most of our patients, just because the Seattle Heart Failure Model has a lot of variables, and most of them are really not readily available uh, at the time of the procedure, so we really don't use them much. But again, if you really want to use the best score we have, essentially the Seattle Heart Failure Model does predict better than a pains D score um, uh, adverse procedural events. And what are those? These are the curves here. On the left side, you can see uh, freedom from uh, death and transplant after the procedure uh, with the uh, Seattle Heart Failure Model on the left side and the Pains D score on the right side. These are third tiles of score. And it's clear again that the third third tile of Pains D score or Seattle Heart Failure Model score uh, classified patients at extremely high risk, uh, significantly high risk actually, of adverse post procedural outcomes compared to the first and second third tile. So this is the higher risk <coughs> group. So after this, the guidelines were updated in 2019, and now there is a statement that says that the pains D score and the Seattle Heart Failure Model were recommended for pre-procedural risk stratification in patients with structural heart disease undergoing VT ablation. Now the big question is what can we do now, uh, besides of course selecting patients uh, with high risk and trying to do everything we can during the procedure to prevent decompensation, including invasive monitoring and so forth. So can we do anything to prevent decompensation? in addition to that. And here, this was again a propensity match analysis where we use Impella, essentially CP, preventively. In other words, before uh, the hemodynamic decompensation happened, where, and it was a propensity matched based on the pain's D score. Some of these patients actually have a relatively lower risk, and we'll talk about that later, a one-to-one -one, uh, with patients that didn't receive the Impella. And here you can see the incidence of decompensation seemed to decrease from uh, close to 20 to 25%, again, consistent with our prior data, down to about 7%. It wasn't 0% because some of these patients had RV failure, and Impel, of course, by definition, doesn't do much for patients with RV dysfunction. Um, important finding, there was no impact here on VT recurrence, so it doesn't matter if you are Impella supported or not, but it seemed to have an impact in terms of death and freedom from transplant post-procedure. So it seems that we, if we prevent decompensation, we can in some way improve a mortality post-procedure. And subgroup analysis, really, the benefit was only seen in the patient with higher pains dean score, greater than 15. We seen, well, I, would, I would say no benefit seen in patients with lower pains dean score, again, in keeping with prior analysis. This is really not new. Uh, Dr. Mathuria, which is a, um, a, a doctor from the same hospital system here, has shown uh, similarly that preventive LVAD uh, support in patients before that they compensate was associated with a reduction of mortality compared to rescue support. And also we have experience with ECMO from Paolo de la Bella's lab in Milan with the same general findings. Of course, when you try to go for a hemodynamic support uh, at the time of the procedure, you have to make serious considerations. It comes with some price, and uh, of course, there is some complications that come with it. We'll talk about that in a second. These are different options that we have. Typically, um, uh, here, uh, we, we, uh, at least at Cleveland Clinic, we tend to use mostly Impella or ECMO. Uh, we don't use much in balloon pump because I don't think it works well for what we do for VT ablation or tandem heart. 
Um, and in general, of course, uh, Impella is preferred in patients that have um, uh, generally good RV function and no significant pulmonary hypertension compared to other uh, modalities. So for patients with biventricular failure and high pain D score, the question is, can we do anything to improve outcomes in this group? And we designed this pilot study, was the last thing I've done before moving to Cleveland Clinic from Penn, where we essentially created an institutional workflow on how to deal with these patients. So the step one was essentially admit this patient to the ICU under the care of our failure pay, um, um, colleagues for hemodynamic optimization, inotropic support when necessary, but mostly to assess for candidacy for advanced therapies, LVAD and transplant. CT surgery then walked in and implanted the uh, VEC more prophylactically before the decompensation happened. So we evaluated for vascular access sites like CTA on ultrasound, and we have elective initiation of ECMO, either from the femoral artery to femoral vein, or in patients with PAD, we went from the axillary artery to the femoral vein. And then we went for a procedure, ablation. It was catheter ablation targeting all the possible inducible VTs and complete elimination of the electrograms within the substrate. In select group, we repeated NIPs from the defibrillator in basic stimulation the next day while still on ECMO to decide for re-ablation, because before we decannulate, we really want to make sure that there is no uh, residual VT to the best of our knowledge. And with this approach here, our institutional 30-day mortality dropped from a historical 76% down to 11%. Of course, this is only a pilot study. It needs to be replicated, and mostly we really need, we need a randomized, randomized clinical trial to prove this, but it was very encouraging, I would say. So this is again something that has been replicated in other centers, and Paolo de la Bella has this VT unit in Milan where they essentially treat patients similarly, and they found that by instituting a VT unit with heart failure, CT surgery, and cardiac anesthesia, in addition to EP, the outcomes were essentially way better compared to historical controls. So why LVADs uh, may be beneficial during the procedure? First, first of all, they can maintain vital organ perfusion. They will reduce intracardiac feeling pressure, reduce LV volume, wall stress, and VO2. We know that from uh, interventional um, uh, cardiology literature, very augment coronary perfusion, get support circulation during VT induction. And sometimes, of course, we don't want to induce VT, but the patient goes in VT uh, without us wanting it. So as a patient with high burden of VT, and potentially it can reduce the cardiac stunning from multiple VT induction for mapping and also inadverted induction. Just sometimes a single PVC from our catheter will induce VT. So with this in mind, we ask ourselves what if we can go with the best type of hemodynamic support we have, which is full pre-procedural hemodynamic support with 5 to 5.5 liters. And this was something that was presented at HRS last year from uh, our clinical clinic um, uh, experience, essentially, and published later in JAK. When we used um, Impella 5 or 5.5 in high-risk patients to support the circulation during the procedure. Again, these devices are fairly large devices, 21 French, are placed surgically with a graft, essentially. And here, uh, what I want to show you, again, this was a propensity match analysis, we retrospectively, and we found that uh, we do 41 patients with Impella-assisted compared to other 41 with no Impella-assisted, but here it's very busy, but there was no clinical differences in clinical characteristics or other form of comorbidities um, uh, in these two groups. What we did find is that uh, it was interesting that uh, most patients actually received Impella 5.5 in this series, just because we're later on um, enrolled after that. And if you look at the um, procedural data, patients with Impella tended to have more monomorphic VT induced, more VT mapped, and more VT terminated during the procedures. It seems to have a better quality procedure, let's say like that, uh, for VT ablation. We'll see later that that doesn't really, it didn't pan out that way. Procedural time was similar in between two groups. So again, we did everything we could uh, in this group of patients. And when we looked at the complication rate, uh, first of all, this was, I think, the major finding of this paper. We found that they, uh, using the Impella came with a significant cost in our institution. There was a 29% rate of complication compared to 2.4% rate of uh, complication in the control group. So any benefit that you may see with Impella will be largely offset by this high complication rate, and most of them are really related to surgical implantation of the Impella. It was bleeding from the access site, DVTs, and so forth. And I think all of these complications backfired to us, and basically we, see, we saw essentially no benefit, and we'll show you later the, uh, the curves. And here you can see there was hematoma requiring intervention in 41% of the Impella cases, DVT, and in some patients we still had PA arrest at the time of the Impella placement, which of course uh, was an episode of the compensation that was not prevented. <coughs> 
And when we looked at the freedom from death, LVAD and transplant, there was absolutely no difference with one group versus another, and similarly, uh, no difference in freedom from VT or VF. I think if we had a benefit with Impella, it was largely offset by the higher rate of complication that we saw, 29%, again. So essentially, we stopped using the Impella 5.5 um, uh, based on um, the prior criteria that we use, and now we only use it in patients with very high burden of VT, uh, in the ICU, for example, or during the procedure that we can, cannot do substrate-based ablation. In the next, uh, probably, few minutes, um, actually two minutes, I would say, uh, is another topic that we need to talk about. Should we ever say no to uh, catheter ablation? So now we use, over the last year, essentially a standardized uh, VT management approach. We have VT meetings every Monday for inpatients and every Friday for outpatients. We involve our heart failure colleagues, our imaging colleagues, our CT surgery colleagues, and we go through just similar to the LVAD meetings to whether we should even do an ablation procedure. So essentially, all patients with a PAINS-D score greater than 17 and an ejection fraction less than 30%, uh, this will trigger a heart failure consult as an outpatient. By inpatients, of course, they will be seen by heart failure and they will evaluate whether they're candidate for advanced therapies options. And in these patients, hemodynamic support is considered. However, if patients have a PAINS-D score greater than 17 and ejection fraction less than 30% with no advanced therapy options, and there are a significant subgroup of patients like that, then we discuss collegially whether we should even do the case. We discuss with families, and in some patients, actually, we don't take them to the lab because the family doesn't want to expose them to potential high risk of complications. And this will be interesting because we're introducing now palliative medicine in the, uh, as a essential strategy which, uh, for these patients. And a few years from now, we will compare, essentially, patients that we didn't do the ablation to the ones that we ended up doing some form of rescue intervention. And I would be uh, shocked uh, in a negative or positive way, depending whether the outcomes will be any different between the two groups. And that will be something that is in the works, but I think we need data on that. So I will conclude here saying um, how do we manage risk. First of all, in patients with structural heart disease, a pure substrate-based ablation approach without VT induction is not always possible. When possible, of course, go for it. It's safe, manage the fluid during the procedure, and most of the times you can prevent the problem. Although in 63% of our cases that are serious, acute decompensation happened during substrate-based ablation, so just be mindful of that. Periprocedural decompensation and cardiogenic shock is a major concern during our procedures. There is a dramatic increase in short-term mortality risk after procedure, so it has to be prevented. Uh, it can be predicted the pains d score has been developed specifically to predict acute decompensation and adverse post-procedural outcomes in this group of patients. Prophylactic support in patients with high pains d score may be beneficial, but it's not a free ride and needs more data. I think it comes with some price, and any complication we saw it from our prior series will increase the odds of 30-day mortality by a factor of four, so something to be mindful of. Waiting for acute decompensation uh, before starting support, though, we found, and this actually has been replicated by other centers, is a wrong strategy. So if you really have to use a hemodynamic support, you use it before the decompensation event happens and on afterwards, because otherwise the mortality rate is extremely high. And fi finally, in patients with high pains D score with no heart failure exit strategies, it's also reasonable to say no after shared decision making with patients and families. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, that was very relevant. Uh, I'm happy that uh, we have maybe some of the heart failure people here. Um, uh, we'll open the panel for discussion. Not a heart failure, <coughs> but from prevention standpoint, but really enjoyed so much the outcomes data that you have shown. So two questions. One is, I'm trying to come to the terms to the beneficial observational data that you had previously shown with prophylactic versus your recent experience in Cleveland, what were the reasons for the differences? And secondly, you did mention possibly the need for an RCT. My question is that when you have such a strong uh, observational benefit going from 76 to 11, especially in a short term period where the mortality is maybe 40 to 60% in six months, would it be even ethical to randomize those patients to no pre-procedural uh, mechanical support? Yeah, so great question. So for the first question, 
In the first experience, uh, we haven't had a difference in the two groups for uh, periprocedural complications. And we found that periprocedural complications do increase the risk of 30-day uh, mortality. In the second series, with in larger impella that we cannot manage with vascular closure devices, for example, we had a 29% complication rate. So I think that was the key difference between the two studies. And the, the high compli periprocedural complication may be, have offset any benefit that was there, potentially. And the uh, second question about the need for randomized studies. There was a pilot study. When you do a pilot study, essentially, that works in a way that there is a group of attendings, essentially physicians that buy into it, and some others don't. So it's, it's very hard to know, to sort out, whether that was a strategy benefit versus uh, some other confounders and uh, confounding effect uh, that we're not capturing there. Uh, so unless we do, probably the next one will be a registry, a larger multicenter registry, the next step to validate that. But really the ultimate would be uh, randomization because again, um, the old data were done also with different ablation approaches. We tended to induce more VT, for example, to map more in VT and do less substrate. So a lot of things have changed over the last few years, including the multidisciplinary team approach. So all of them may have contributed to better outcomes, and I don't know, uh, the only way to prove that would be, again, to randomize and do it prospectively. So, yeah. Right. yeah. Thank you for the talk. Thank you for being here. I'm one of the heart failure cardiologists. Right. I just want to raise that question. And you guys laughing over there. We have this conversation and struggle all the time. You know, a patient comes with decompensated heart failure. They have a VT. They come here, and we, then we start talking about it. LVAC, you know, as a, as, a, as a backup or as destination therapy or bridge to transplant, you know, uh, whatever we, the patient are required. And always the question comes, you know, um, when to ablate VT, how much is too much VT? Because we're also we worried about this patient, you know, they go and get the LVAC and gonna have a VT after that and get in trouble. Do you have any, you know, word of wisdom or any systematic approach that you have, how you approach this patient, kind of tell us that Yes, go ahead with the LVAD, and we're going to be able to take care of this patient before or after LVAD if they have a VT. So, yes, um, great question. So, first of all, I think the scenario for uh, what we learned with the ARMA2 doesn't really necessarily apply with ARMA3. Actually, we're going to present this data at AHA. Uh, we found that LVAD does reduce burden of VT across the board with HM HM3 compared to HM2 with the past, mm -hmm. because we used to think that whoever has VT before will have it afterwards, inevitably. It's not exactly the same with the harm 3 So first of all, second of all, if we do um, have patients with a high burden of VT and recent episodes of VT, are going for LVAD. So uh, before we take him to the procedure, we don't want him to decompensate. So sometimes we go straight to the LVAD. We map the epicardium at the time of the LVAD implant because that's the only chamber that we cannot access again after the LVAD is in place. We ablate everything we can intraoperatively in the epicardial surface, then the LVAD is in, and the patient has VT afterwards, then we go back in, we can always access the endocardium if necessary. That, that's the approach for patients with high burden of VT, assuming that we think it's an epicardial focus. If it is a, some form of basal septal VT, then at that point we usually uh, we either ablate them earlier before the LVAD when necessary, but really we don't want to do that in patients that are already scheduled for an LVAD surgery. So they go for LVAD and then we take them right afterwards if necessary. But again, heart rate 3 seems like there is a reduction of burden of VT uh, pretty much across the board that we've seen. Compare, and it, it, it wasn't the case with the old version of the uh, LVAD. Again, it's only observational, but I think it's an interesting finding so far. It's a, it's a problem that we've struggled with. Our surgeons have this conception. Our surgeons, our surgeons, we start with our surgeons because they have this conception that, uh, misconception, I think, that, that VT is a contraindication for LVAD because uh, somehow, uh, the occurrence of VT after LVAD uh, obviously compromises the outcomes and the concern about the, how they report the outcomes. And for us, it's really not a contraindication. In fact, if someone has VT that we can know, we can identify the substrate, and we know they may be at too high risk for, a, for an ablation because they have decompensated heart failure. In our approach, the EP side, um, it's perfectly fine to get the LVAD and then we'll deal with the VT with the yeah. LVAD. And sure, you have some concern limitations about the epicardium, like you mentioned, but at the same time, you have you have strong hemodynamic support that you only need to worry about the RV. Yeah. So, thank you for coming and sharing some of your thoughts. I have a couple of questions. One is, from what I gather, is that the high mortality in these individuals is either 
because of the substrate of heart failure that they come in as opposed to the procedure itself, or in the support of the heart failure situation, which is like 25% is quite high. Why is it so high in this population compared to maybe other populations? And which brings the other question, although less impressive with using a balloon as opposed to an impeller 5.5 help in this situation because obviously the impact may be less, but the complication rate may be less. So that's one. The other one is, does the mode of ablation matter? Epicardial, endocardial, alcohol, or even surgery in some situation? Yeah, so uh, first question is uh, uh, interesting. Yes, for patients with uh, advanced heart failure, NVT are higher risk than the other populations. I think that's the key uh, difference between the two. Whenever VT happens, then it selects a, patient, a group of patients with extremely much higher risk to other, compared to other population. And as a result of that, we see these uh, outcomes. Now, intraprocedural decompensation, and that's the question. I think some of it has to do also with intraprocedural management. It's very hard to sort that out. Actually, we've been looking also at doses of pressors, type of pressors, the reflex from most anesthesiologists to hypotension is to increase the vasopressors, which is really uh, a significant afterload for the left ventricle. And sometimes what happens is that uh, you cause heart failure just because of that, because they push like vasopressors and so forth. So we've been changing all that and we're trying to communicate better with them. We use intracardiac feeling pressures to prevent that. Uh, but again, uh, to, for the qu first question, I think patients with uh, structural heart disease, NVT, has already selected themselves to be high risk to begin with. Balloon pump, yeah, so that's really, um, I was interested in looking in ischemic versus non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. What was the difference with that? We haven't seen an impact really um, in terms of benefit with balloon pump. It comes with some complication, not much of course, with bleeding complication, but it seemed to have no impact in terms of the uh, benefit that we've seen. And it goes without saying that in some cases, especially for patients with high burden of VT, the ones that we really want mechanical support, balloon pump is not going to be able to trigger on that. So, and uh, because they stay more in VT than sinus, and it becomes complicated to actually use that. Um, so, um, finally, the, the question was about the uh, uh, okay, the type of ablation. Yes, I. Um, I think uh, we've all, we've all been transitioning in this. Uh, when I was uh, years ago uh, uh, training, uh, the mantra was to induce VT, terminate VT, then induce another VT, map the second VT, terminate that, and keep going until either the old VTs were gone or the patient was gone. Uh, but, uh, but now, actually, the way we all work, essentially, we understand with imaging preprocedure where the subshot is, uh, uh, where the location of the subject is, is intramural, epicardial, endocardial. So that's already important for planning. And based on what it is, we already decide for type of strategies, endo versus epicardia. So everything is planned, but mostly we work in sinus rhythm as much as possible with minimal induction. We try to limit the induction of VTs when possible to max one minute during the procedure just to validate that the VT is coming from the substrate. And the type of ablation, I mean, it's really, uh, and you know, uh, Miguel is a pioneer of alcohol uh, bailout strategies. We use it when necessary. This is not something that we go as a first line. Uh, but in some patients, the only way to make, make it go away when we target the intramural uh, substrate in particular, in between the walls that we cannot map and we cannot ablate is with alcohol injection. That's more of a bailout to, to deal with complex cases, but we haven't seen an impact uh, in terms of the uh, mortality or uh, decompensation risk with different strategies. Yeah. So I'm one of the, <clears throat> and each one of the advanced imaging fellows. I have two questions. Question one was when you showed the graph where you went from 76% to 11% mortality, what was the, is there, was there any difference in your turn down rate earlier versus later in terms of VT with the new approach? And then the second question is in terms of, say, cardiac MRI or substrate imaging, how do you incorporate that data in the lab as a more practical sense? Right. So. At that time, there was really much uh, idea about turning down patients, actually, for us. We tend to take everybody to the lab. And now, there's something that we've been introducing like, more recently uh, when I moved to Cleveland, essentially, because I, re I realized from my colleagues, there was a, they had some specific criteria when they decided to go for CT surgery, for example, versus not. We don't have any of that. So that's why we started doing that uh, right now. 
I, uh, th th it's always complicated to turn someone down for a procedure, honestly, because um, if you, if for this rescue intervention, if you do 50 and you help one patient, I think it's still worth it, honestly. And, uh, uh, but again, uh, it's more of a big number. We need to go back and look at our experience in the future. How do we incorporate imaging? So two things, we did, uh, I didn't present the study, but uh, Dr. Winterfield from uh, uh, MUSC uh, has worked on the integration of the scar size, essentially, on top of the pain's discord to predict the compensation during the procedure, which is very intuitive. In other words, if you have a high pain's discord with a large substrate, of course, you have to ablate more. Essentially, they have to map more and ablate more. That means more fluid. So he predicts the compensation during the procedure. But the other aspect is also, it's very crucial to understand where the scar is distributed and located. And uh, in particular, when it's subendocardial, of course, we only use an endocardial approach. When it's endoepicardial, transmural, sometimes we have to go both endo and epi. When it's intramural, we have to get ready with uh, bailout strategies like alcohol ablation, bipolar ablation, so it's very helpful. In addition to the scar, there's also some other things that are helpful. Uh, coronary vessel distribution for epicardial ablation, coronary sinus distribution vessel for alcohol ablation. Sometimes we can reconstruct the phrenic nerve by simply segmenting the periphericardiophrenic artery, so that helps us when you are epicardially. And then impediment to ablation, intramyocardial fat, clot, etc. All these structures essentially that can be intramyocardial or uh, endocardial, they will impede from uh, signal recording but also ablation e efficacy. So that all gather from imaging, and that's why I think it's so helpful for us. So. My comment about rescue versus preemptive hemodynamic support, because the, the upfront cost in terms of risk and procedural complications of putting a 14 French sheath uh, for the impella, most of us have evolved to, okay, just wait and see. Um, and, and my point, my question is, what do you think about this idea of having more preemptive, so more prompt rescue versus rescue when you're in really deep trouble. Uh, which is kind of what has been our approach is, okay, we can get by doing a substrate-based mapping without induction or maybe indu inducing only at the end. And if the patient can get through it, then you know we can go by, we can get by with a low risk, and it's all high risk, but low risk VT ablation I think it's most of us which think that it's worth trying with, yeah, getting ready to put an impella before we really get in trouble. So I, I kind of have evolved to having that approach. You call it rescue, yes, technically it would be rescue, but kind of an early and prompt rescue. Yeah. And, and it's kind of worked for us because the, the idea of paying the upfront price of a 14 French sheet that if you're gonna leave it there, you're gonna need surgery, vascular surgery to take it out, to close it. Um, the risks of uh, access issues, uh, it's just not, has not been worthwhile for us. Yeah, great point. Um, all the data that I showed you was uh, with uh, essentially cardiogenic shock during yeah. the procedure. So it appear arrest or uh, uh, like significant hypotension with multiple pressors. So it's advanced like stage. Yeah. If you can do the same or better with the early rescue, which is still some form of or late preventive, yeah. some, I, I yeah. want to call it. Uh, yes, I mean, we haven't looked at that. So sometimes you can just take him to the lab and after 20, 30 minutes, you realize yeah. that it's not going to work that way. And then uh, you do it early. It's still yeah. early. I think the outcomes will be just as good, but we haven't looked at that. Also, you alluded to one thing, the, the anesthesia communication. That has made so much of a difference. Right. I, I, I tell them before you start, uh, more phenylephrine or add two vasopressors, maybe add some dobutamine so that I, sure you may counteract the hypotensive have the blood pressure effect, but at least you don't, you're not adding more afterload to a six sick ventricle and, and the communication really has made a big difference. Yeah, for what we do, there is so much swings in blood pressure and heart rate. They really, they, it's the only field where they are completely lost. And they use the same cocktail of drugs for everybody. Yeah. Cholecystectomy and so forth. Any <laughs> form of hypertension, they is re respond with the same way. And by more communication is be helpful because really, uh, they sometimes react very quickly to hypotension. But for us, sometimes it's just program stimulation. It's something that we're doing. So just communicating with them, saying, listen, for the next 10 seconds, you will see hypotension. Don't react to it. And then if we have to do something, they will let you know. They helped a lot. Yeah. I hope some of them are here today. Yeah. <laughs> I also have one question about this RGP result in the echo were really striking. You know, they have 
Patty, can you comment on the, the patient selection as far as the, how, how you do the, the ECMO? That's one question also related to that. Do you use any LD loading, uh, unloading strategy with those ECMO as well during the ablation? Yeah, so one patient with, uh, uh, was uh, unloaded with Impella at the end, uh, otherwise not. Uh, there were nine patients, where I should have, first of all, so small pool group, small pilot study. So because these are small side group of patients that come to us. And the only criterion was high pains D greater than 17. There was evidence of biventricular failure, so the RV was also down, and VT storm. It's almost nearly incessant VT or high burden of VT. This was the inclusion criteria. But again, when we look at the absolute number, really, we're talking about probably less than 1% of patients that we come for VT ablation. So it's really a small subgroup. Uh, and the, um, yes, essentially we did it uh, electively uh, in a, uh, with a surgeon that is very well versed in doing uh, ECMO cannulation and so forth. But anything that is done electively is actually the outcomes are always better than doing it like uh, uh, in a rush with uh, starting from the vascular access portion and so forth. So it was really encouraging, but again, uh, I, I um, we need we need randomization. We need prospective randomization to to prove it. In my opinion, yeah. Right. Thank you very much, Scott. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks so much. <laughs>